Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through the prayers of our Holy Father, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudato Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome once again to Preparation for the Holy Sacrifice. This is the Gill Family Stream. Every week when we prepare our hearts and our souls and our bodies for the Holy Sacrifice on Sunday in three different rites of the Catholic Church. And we give thanks, we give thanks for this week. We give thanks for God's providential care over the entire world during this week. That's what we call the news. We talk about the news and we give thanks that God's providential care is over all things. So today we're going to talk about Bishop Tissier's death and the future of the SSBX. Uh, the good bishop has passed to his eternal reward. And so we're going to pray for his soul and talk about what that means for the future. We've had a number of uh, natural disasters in the United States, two huge hurricanes. Many people have had to flee their homes and face the damage. Talk about that a little bit. Also, we're going to go into a hitch, a little bit of a history of the modern Middle East, introduction to the modern Middle East, which plays into the Holy Week or the Holy Land update. Um, there was just some things that happened yesterday. And then tomorrow is one of the most sacred days of the year for rabbinic Jews, Yom Kippur. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's significant because of what happened and what the date was on October 7 last year. Uh, then we'll talk about the Ukraine update. What's going on in Ukraine? The Pope met with Patriarch Svetoslav as well as Zelensky, and also an exciting uh, update, an exciting thing to talk about that is, which is Sister Wilhelmina, and uh, what's going on. I'll share a little bit of the personal story for me uh, as to what I'm doing. I'm going on retreat starting today, actually, the Feast of Our Lady of Ephesus, and um, we'll talk a little bit about my personal story on that that I don't share publicly. Um, but this is for our guild community. So if you want to be a part of the guild community and prepare for the Holy Sacrifice together, you have to go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to get the whole show here. Now, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, this su coming Sunday is the, um, I, I'm sorry, the 21st, 21st Sunday after Pentecost, 28th Sunday, Tempest Per Annum. I've been doing so many. I just uh, posted the recording for next Sunday, Sunday after next, uh, because I'm going on retreat. So confusing all the Sundays here. But 21st Sunday after Pentecost is the uh, 
Parable of the Unmerciful Servant. And this is a very powerful lesson for all of us, especially for us who have some community on the internet, that we must be merciful to our brethren. It's a most it's a very powerful gospel lesson because it shows the mercy and severity of the Lord. The mercy and the severity. So it was because if you go to the very end, when the unmerciful servant for, refuses to forgive, his Lord being angry delivered him to the torturers until he paid all the debt. Now, if you know anything about all these talents, you know that there's no, it's impossible to pay this debt. This debt is, it would take many lifetimes of wages to pay the debt that was owed by the unmerciful servant. And then the Lord Jesus says, so also shall my heavenly father do to you if you forgive not everyone his brother from your hearts. So if we don't have merciful, we don't have mercy to our brethren, we'll go to hell. We'll burn in hell forever. That's the message. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And reminds me of uh, one of the cursing psalms where the Lord Jesus in the Psalms curses Judas. And one of the reasons that Judas is cursed, the Psalm says, because he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted one who was poor and needy. And so the Lord is very severe against those who are unmerciful. And that's why and that's what I mean. This is kind of the message of Meaning of Catholic. We're, we're trying to promote mercy, mercy among Catholics, where we can look at our fellow Catholics of different stripes, different rights, different opinions of current controversies. And we need to live in the reality of our communion at the Eucharistic altar. Because if we are truly in communion, and I'm not talking about her heretical things, I'm talking about these dubious matters. So that is a very critical lesson that we all need to hear again and again. The collect for the 21st Sunday beseeches the Lord to hold thy family in continual loving kindness. The word in, in uh, Latin is pietas, which is usually used, pietas is usually a virtue regarding our duties towards our parents and our fatherland and to God. But what's interesting is that it uses the word from God to us. And so God looks upon us as his children. Psalm 103, 102, 103 is uh, as a father, as a father has compassion on his sons. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So this is great mercy and love that God has for us. And that's why he forgave the unmerciful servant. We would beseech him to have mercy on us. But in order to receive that mercy, we must be merciful to our brother and forgive our brother from our hearts. In the Greek rite this Sunday, we have the commemoration of the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And this is an interesting uh, Fatima connection here because uh, this is a really great, a huge feast day that takes place on October 13. And it's not a feast day in the Western Church. October 13, obviously the miracle of the sun takes place. This is the commemoration of the miracle of the sun, the final apparition of Our Lady. It has to do with the conversion of Russia. But there is multiple, there are multiple layers of, of meaning in the Fatima apparitions. This is uh, some of the personal update on my books that I'm going to um, give you in a minute in the, uh, the guild only portion. So October 13 commemorates the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. So there were two triumphs of orthodoxy regarding iconoclasm. The first triumph happened on October 13, 787. That was the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and that was under Empress Irene. So there's two there's two triumphs, and they're both under empresses. So this harkens back to St. Polcaria, the Byzantine emperor, empress who helped to, was a very, a Marian uh, saint who helped to coordinate the 
third and fourth ecumenical councils. And today's feast day, in fact, commemorates the Council of Ephesus, um, the uh, Our Lady's maternity. Now, October 13, the apparition of the sun commemorates this, this, uh, the I the triumph against iconoclasm under Irene. And then there is, so this, this is the date is October 13, but it gets transferred to the Sunday because it's such a big feast day. So this Sunday coincides with October 13 and it's also the Sunday. So it just stays on the same day. And then there's the other, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, which is this first Sunday of Lent, which is that, that, triumph was under empress theodora that a whole iconoclast controversy took about a hundred years there were many martyrs in the east um and in the west we did not have our iconoclasm until the protestant revolt happened and then again later on in the 20th century with the new iconoclasm but this council the seventh ecumenical council so it has the this chronological connection with fatima um and there's great mysteries with that because I, I iconography is about manifesting the incarnation and the miracle of the sun certainly manifests the reality of the mother of God in Fatima. Um, so there's great mysteries that are, are yet to be explored there, that connection. Um, the other connection that uh, is that on that date, on in 1917 the russian church was preparing for their greatest marian feast day one of their greatest marian feast days in the year which is only celebrated among the slavic churches which is pokrov the, the protection of the theotokos so there's also another connection another layer layer of connection with fatima so those are mysteries yet to be explored in in my upcoming book on the matter which we'll talk about a little bit more in the guild portion anyhow um so the uh, one of the fun things about the Sunday of Orthodoxy in the first Sunday of Lent is that there's all these anathemas that are yelled out. If you have a the pontifical Greek rite, you mention all these heresies and then you yell anathema, anathema. So it's kind of fun, and you have a procession with icons and all that good stuff. I've never actually experienced this at, when I was Eastern Orthodox. I never experienced the the true the fullness of the Sunday of Orthodoxy in in these these um, processions and anathemas, but. If you have a bishop in town, that's what happens. It's pretty awesome. So one of the anathemas is, on those who accept with their reason the incarnate economy of the God, the word, but will not allow that this can be beheld through images and therefore affect to receive our salvation in words, but deny it in reality. Anathema! On those who wickedly make play of the word uncircumscribed and therefore refuse to depict in images of Christ our true God, who likewise shared our flesh and blood, and therefore show themselves to be fan phantasiasts, anathema, on those who accept with their reason the incarnate economy. Okay, so that was the other one I just read. So, so those are the two iconoclasm anathemas that are read on the Sunday of Orthodoxy. I think that's interesting because this is kind of the Protestant doctrine here because they had a, they receive it with their words, but they deny it in reality in terms of the incarnate reality. The Seventh Ecumenical Council is also significant because there's there's all so those are the deeper theological reasons for icons, but there's even a even sort of a almost a more mundane reason, but yet even more significant. And one of the anathemas from the Seventh Ecumenical Council is, "quote Whoever rejects a written or unwritten tradition of the Church, let him be anathema." End quote. And that's because even without this, this factor, all these factors regarding the incarnation, that theology, they're still just destroying sacred art. And that alone is enough to anathematize them, even if there weren't these theological reasons. And that's because the whole disposition of a Catholic is to preserve and pass down the sacred tradition of our forefathers. So whoever rejects a written and unwritten tradition, let him be anathema. So, and sacred art is one of the lower type traditions in terms of, uh, you know, this is not just, this is not the liturgy per se, it's sacred art. It should not be rejected. It should not be destroyed. Anathema sit. So, um, I love the gospel for this Sunday because it, it, it's uh, John 17, 1 to 13, which ends with the line, 
it's the high priestly prayer of Christ before his passion in St. John. He says, now I come to thee and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy filled in themselves. In the Greek, it's karan amin pepliromenin. So that there may be a fullness perfected of my joy in them. This is this is the, the spiritual joy of the spirit that we need to have in Christ, that Christ wants to give us joy. And this is what we can have joy in, in the providential nature of God. So in the Novus Ordo Mise, the rite of Paul VI, it is the 28th Sunday, Tempus Par Anum. And one of the powerful things about this Sunday is that it links the seeking of wisdom with the renunciation of earthly things. So there's a reading from wisdom, but then the gospel is from Mark 10. So in the new lectionary, the first reading and the gospel always coincide, whereas the second reading follows a different uh, theme. So just sort of a continuous reading of the various epistles. So they don't necessarily coincide. Um, but this re this reminded me of a, a passage that I had recently read from Spiritual Combat that really struck me. Um, where is my Spiritual Combat? I, th I thought I put it down right here. Uh, here it is. So... Spiritual Combat, Chapter 8. Of the hindrances to a right discernment of things and of the course which he, we should take in order to judge truly concerning them. Uh, this is thing that's really struck me recently, just um, as I've thought recently about um, praying the 15 decade rosary every day and how much our thoughts determine our emotions. And it should not be the other way around. Here's what Scupoli says. Our failure in judging the things above mentioned and of others must be traced to the precipitancy with which at the first blush we regard them either with love or hatred. And thus the understanding is blinded and hindered from taking a dispassionate view of them. Therefore, what we may not be in this way deceived, we must keep our will as much as possible in, dis in suspense and free from all inordinate affections. When any object then is presented to you, view it with your understanding and give it mature consideration before you conceive a hatred for it or a rejection of it, if it is contrary to your natural inclinations, or before you are inspired with a love for it, if it is agreeable to your taste. So he's Scopoli is saying something happens, good or evil, for us, and we need to have a certain distance from that in order to judge it properly. And this is exactly what the lesson today, one of the key lessons of this Sunday is we have to renounce all of our attachments in order to see clearly. We can't even see the truth clearly unless we first renounce our attachments. And he says this, for when the understanding unclouded by passion acts freely and clearly, it is able to detect the truth and to penetrate into the evil, which is hidden under a fair appearance and into the good which is veiled by a semblance of evil. Whereas if the will is first inclined to love or hate anything, the understanding afterwards cannot exercise a sound judgment upon it because the affection intervening between the object and the mind prevents a just view of the object and the understanding given back to the will, this false impression excites the will afresh to a love or hatred more vehement than before in spite of every rule and law of reason. And one of the most important truths is that we need to love suffering if we don't love suffering we cannot advance spiritually and this is one of the most difficult things to see but it is the wisdom and we can only see that wisdom if we first detach ourselves and then we can look at the suffering that's happening the sacrament of the present moment and we can see that and we can embrace that cross so that's what i i found in, in the novus ordo mise for this sunday so with that, let's talk about all the news and the providential uh, guidance of our, our, our Lord over the earth. And we'll be back in just a minute. If you want the full show, you got to subscribe to meaningofcatholic.com slash register.